In this last lecture, I wanted to share some of the lessons I had to learn the hard way when trying to intervene, socially construct, managing change in the digital age. And the interesting thing is these particularities, they seem to be independent. I encounter them when I, I consult with the private sector and digital transformation projects of the most diverse industries or when I work in the public sector, because they're really inherent, it seems, to, to the digital age and to technological revolutions actually in general. So let's walk through them. The first of all that we have to consider is the uncertainty of the trajectory. We're dealing with exponential technological progress and humans are notoriously bad in thinking in exponentials. We think linearly and we notoriously underestimate the power and the speed of something like a doubling process. So we'll have to talk about what we can do about that and uh, like force us not to get lost in exponential technological progress, some kind of safeguard. So that's the idea of this lecture. Second of all, we are dealing with an all persuasive general purpose technology. That means inevitably you will step on many toes and there are some turfs that are more or less sensitive and they also get reorganized with digitalization and with algorithmification. So in a company, for example, the different vice presidencies, kind of, they might be changing. For example, if you create a central big data center, then all the other previous tours have to connect to that one. So that is then like what happens with that vice president and who is the vice president in charge of the data? Or how do you reorganize the entire company? Same as with algorithmification. So if you now have kind of like machine learning simulation. So who is in charge of that and who does that? It also is useful that. So a lot of transformations going on, you inevitably will step on some toes when you are in a digital transformation project. And that doesn't only happen. I mean, I of course deal a lot about with that when, when I work in digital transformation projects in companies, but also in the government. I mean, who in the government is actually in charge of digital? They're kind of like a number to call or a ministry or a secretary of, and we will have to talk about how to manage change in an all persuasive general, with all per pervasive general purpose technology. And third, creative destruction has unpredictable side effects per definition. It destroys and creates a new. So how would you know? It's a complex, adaptive, evolving ecosystem. And that is inherent actually to all technological revolutions. And we have to talk about what we can do about that. And then I will probably most extend myself on the internationality of digital networks. Digital information communication inherently doesn't consider national boundaries. It doesn't stop at a national boundary. Now, we try to create our firewalls, but they are extremely leaky. And once you create a web page, you have to consider that it's there. It's, it's on the World Wide Web. Most typically, a web page would be. And communication, also the internet communication, travels through the internet network all over the globe. So as I said, there might be firewalls, that might, but they are extremely leaky, very usually. And on the other hand, also the algorithmification paradigm. Once one artificial intelligence has learned something, one ability, then Infinite economies of scale, just copy paste. It just goes all over the globe extremely quickly. You might have it behind a paywall or behind a firewall or something, but it goes much faster than you think. And what I want to talk about here is that we are often not sensitive enough uh, to consider the reality of our unfinished globalization of the global playing field as it is, as unequal as it is, as unfinished as it is, and as diverse and unbalanced as it is. And we might know that and, heard, and we might have heard about it, but I find more often than not, if digital innovation projects happen, I don't know if we forget about it or we are quite insensitive to it. So I want to take this last segment of this last lecture to extend myself a little bit about that, to remind ourselves of the inherent internationality of the space 
of flows. It's not geography that matters in the digital realm. It's the digital network structure that matters. And we have to consider when the space of flows, the digital space of flows, meets the geographic reality of our unfinished business of globalization. Let's start by talking about the uncertainty of this directory, which comes from exponential technological progress. We said that every exponential progress can be represented as a doubling process. You can just take the logarithm of two and you see the times of doublings that have happened in that process. So that means doubling also means that in each doubling period, you make as much technological progress as you have made since the beginning of time, as the, since the beginning of that process. So let's go to the beginning of the digital paradigm and let's see what doubling would mean. Doubling would mean that in the next period of doubling, I don't know how quickly doubles, storage doubles every two and a half years, computation every one to two years, one and a half years. So there's a certain doubling rate that means in the next whatever few years, we will make as much progress as we made since well, let's say, let's, let's just assume this would be the beginning of the digital paradigm with the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center computer and Pong, <laughs> if you remember that game. And that's the progress we made. Here, that's what games looked like when I played them as a kid. And that was the first operating system. Before that, we didn't even have a notion of what an operating system was. Microsoft came up with Windows, and that's why we now have, we organize our things in Windows. Now here, graphics became quite better. The first role-playing games were in there, the beginning of what now we could call the Metaverse 2D here. Lara Croft looks um, a lot better by then, also some more interactivity. Here, these video games, they cost a billion dollars by then, these animations, but still 2D. And then, of course, we enter the 3D Metaverse. So if you could have made the predictions from back then to here, then you see that's the amount of roughly technological progress the doubling would mean we make as much progress in the next doubling period, which might be the next one to two, three years, and it doesn't even matter, even if it would be four or five years, it's just breath, it's just too quickly. And then all of that will double in the next period. So actually the length of the doubling doesn't matter. What matters is that's an exponential progress, and that's just too quick for us humans to judge. So what to do about that? What to do about the uncertainty of the trajectory? Well, the secret is to Think long term, but to act short term and uh, to build this into the structure of your intervention, of your policy or of your business strategy. And I will use here an example that I happen to have first an experience with the design of the first digital action plan of the governments of Latin America and the Caribbean. So back in the early 2000s, there was a world summit on the information society. World summits in the UN lingo is when all the world leaders meet. So they have different topics, could be on the environment. The Rio summit was very famous. And there have been two on the information society in the early 2000s that I had the pleasure to, to attend long negotiations about crucial topics when the digital age just got going. So in the early 2000s, they decided on some global goals. So these were long-term goals that they mixed together with the global development agenda in general. Back then, that was called the Millennium Development Goals, MDG, Millennium Development Goals, that were goals that went until the year 2015. Now, this long-term agenda was the global agenda. And the Millennium Development Goals had all kinds of goals from the environment to poverty, to gender, to children, to safety. And the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean was a regional agenda that was a topical agenda on digital development. But it used the same time frame until 2015. Now, 10 years, that's incredible. You have too many doublings in there. What the plan was is to have a short-term agenda. The first digital action plan, so I call these action plans e luck You know that from the E from the cube. So the electronic Latin America and the Caribbean action plan. And it was the e luck 2007. That was the first generation of it. And that was agreed in Rio de Janeiro. And it had very concrete goals only for two years. And this agenda then was evaluated two years later in 2007 in El Salvador. And a new agenda came up, a new development agenda action plan met there. The governments met again and they adjusted it again. And then the ELAC 2010 uh, was established, which then 
again, two years later, met in Peru, in, in Lima, Peru, and a new agenda was established. ELAC 2010 was then established. And so go on, and Lima then was uh, created the ELAC 2015. And there we went to catch up with the global agenda. So while the global agenda had very long-term, lofty, broad goals, what the region of Latin America and the Caribbean did is first of all brought it locally down and kept it short term. It adjusted the agenda every two, every two to three years. And that kept on going. So while the global agenda then also was renovated with the sustainable development goals. We had other long-term goals. The Millennium Development Goals were a big success globally. Most of them were fulfilled. Poverty was reduced and so forth. It was maybe the first time that the world actually had one global policy agenda. Then the extension of that were the Sustainable Development Goals that currently are being worked on. And ELAC evolved too. So there was ELAC 2015. ELAC 2018, ELAC 2022, and so forth. So that is still ongoing and has been still ongoing and has been well alive. Now, I left there and I, I retired from the United Nations at the time and joined academia. And you see, when I left, also the logos became much better. <laughs> I'm very glad to see that. So now we can see here we are just in the fifth, sixth, seventh generation of this ELAC action plan. Now, what's important to, to point out that every two or three years, a decisive number of goals also changed. So we have only about, let's like say, a quarter of the goals were very similar every every two or three years. Another quarter of the goals had no equivalent and half of the goals stayed, but they had some very severe adjustments. So that means two or three years, that's actually already enough. That's, that's very long term. Now, two or three years for public policy agendas is incredibly fast because the public sector moves slow, but also for a private sector company. If you have on the strategy level, on the on a digital transformation, on a digital transformation agenda in, in a big company, two or three years go extremely fast. And what the idea is here, setting long-term goals and having short-term adjustments, because as you can see, three quarters of the goals need adjustment and one quarter of the goals, actually two, three years ago, you had no idea that they are as important to make the top priorities. Now that looks nice on a graph and as a basic principle. Now in practice, that comes down to a lot, a lot of meetings and a lot, a lot of talking, very long meetings. These World Summit meetings, they go on for weeks and some people seem to lose even their hair over it. That's how stressful where it is. And then you just sit in these meetings for a long time. And it's actually a human task. And especially in a world where artificial intelligence becomes the upper hand and helps us to figure out in general how to go about things, the question that we meet and constantly meet and make sure that our goals, what's the function, the function that we strive for that this keeps being updated, especially in an environment that changes as quickly. That becomes the crucial task. So it is a social enterprise to make sure that goals stay updated with these short-term agendas. Digital technology doesn't only require very frequent coordination meetings, but also very broad coordination because it's an all pervasive general purpose technology. You step inevitably on many feet. It touches many different things. Here, I just tell you because you know that's just what I was working in. These are 17 national, so that previously was a regional development action plan. These are national development action plans from 17 different countries. And you can see that they only agreed on two priorities in digital development, access and e-government. The rest was quite diverse on what they focused on. So you can focus on all kinds of things. You can focus on a di digital disaster management system as your top priority or to develop a software industry as a top priority. And if you really want to know what actually public policy focus on, you don't follow the documents, you, you follow the money. And there you can use the cube as well. And you can see actually how different national governments distribute their funds according to the different priorities, how much they put into hardware infrastructure, that's kind of like the access digital divide, how much they put into software development, maybe into a software industry or in the training of artificial intelligence or the development, and how much they invest in human skills. So you can cut the cake according to the cube this way. You can also cut it by sectors and you can see, well, how much do they put in education, using digital technology for education, for defense or in the health sector. And you can fine grain 
these different sectors. And you can see this is an example of the Chilean government that I've been working with from, from quite some time ago, but it doesn't change over time. So basically these policy agendas still are you still used for different purposes. And you can even see how much money in, are invested into incentive problems. These are subsidies, for example, subsidizing small and medium-sized enterprises to adopt something or giving them tax breaks or regulations, putting money into compliance that, for example, hospitals and the health sector or the finance sector has to comply with something by the use of digital tools. So you can use the cube. This is just an example also to see how the cube has been used. You can see, okay, so how much funds went into regulation, how much funds went into incentives and did that go into human resources, into software or into hardware and into what sectors did that go. Often also defense is a big sector where the government is spending, but also health, for example, or the judicial. Judicial reform can be very much advanced with digital technology. And here you can see that this is a general purpose technology that touches all sectors, not only in a company, but also in the government. Now in a company, it's very similar. There are usually traditionally different legacy information databases that now have to be connected, especially in order to get the big data. And that leads to a big coordination between, between the different actors. And that leads me already to the solution. What do you do when you have a general purpose technology that basically steps on all the different toes? Well, don't try to centralize it. The, the, the most efficient approach that you've seen is a decentralized agenda, a very coordinated decentralized agenda. Now it has to be coordinated, but it's coordinated by the, by the normal hierarchy. Well, eventually things, if you, if you work in a hierarchy, it doesn't have to be. My friends from the blockchain and from the decentralized autonomous organization would say, don't need a hierarchy, you need a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization that coordinates the decentralized approach. Traditionally, when you work with companies or with governments, they're just hierarchies traditionally, but then even there, it's very useful to keep a decentralized organization with very broad input and get the input for everybody in order to create a digital agenda. And again, if you wanna know where the action actually is, then just follow the money. If you follow the money, you wanna, you're want you gonna see if people put their money where their mouth is. So this is the funds in South Korea, which put a lot of funds, for example, in broadband strategy. In South Korea, went very far with the development of broadband. In the United States, well, back then in, in, in the, this administration, what happened, we had different authorities with different amounts of budget. And you can see that actually, let's say the technology authorities, the FCC and the National Telecom and Information Administration, they had like whatever, 8 billion and 7 billion, but the rest of the government had 70. So let's say that the majority, let's say roughly to keep it rough, 70% of the budget was distributed among all kinds of agencies. Now you could also ask, well, who was in charge of that? Well, in that administration, they had three different coordinators. And here in the United States, we often do that. Our financial system is also set up like that. That's how Hamilton set it up, that we have a very decentralized financial system. And also with general purpose technologies, that's actually uh, extremely useful that you have different authorities in charge of different aspects because information, communication, and knowledge just affects every different sector of society. And you find something very similar if you go into companies. So in companies, as I said, they're different sectors with different legacy systems. So when you try to coordinate it, it's of course extremely useful to create the big data and to connect them. And inevitably, you also, well, you modernize the organizational structure of the company. You inevitably will. You have to reorganize that. And you, it's also often a question of cultural change, much more than technological. I mean, you can get some technology consultants that just connect the databases, but that like the vice presidents that you step on their feet then while you're doing that. So it's much more cultural work, digital transformation of an established company than a technological challenge. And the recipe seems to be here just to really appreciate that's a general purpose technology that nobody really owns this, that every sector of a company can majorly benefit from it and that they are the ones who really know how to use it best. And that's also true. I mean, the nurses 
are the best to know how to use technology in that application of the hospital. The elementary school teachers are the best that know how to use this technology. It's not like you send a software engineer there, that would be useless. And the same applies to different sectors and different companies. So to create a decentralized agenda and then to coordinate together and get very broad input. So that's a way that has been very successful in coordinating that. It's one approach that has been very successful to coordinate the decentralized nature of a general purpose technology. Uh, to go back to that example, what, what we did here in this exercise, when we updated the action plan of Latin America and the Caribbean, the ELAC, and we went from the ELAC 2007 to the ELAC 2010, and we had 30 governments involved, what we did is we really reached out extremely broadly and as was said in the study, in studies you always use big, important words. So what this he said, it was the most extensive online participatory policy-making foresight exercise in the history of intergovernmental processes in the developing world. I mean, if you make it so specific, then you can use big words. <laughs> but what we did here is basically we reached out very broad. So the first action plan, ELAC 2007, was basically born on my computer. And I just wrote a draft and we sent it to all the countries and they ripped it apart and then they adjusted it and that's what we approved. Now, when we updated it, I thought, how arrogant was that? Like, who am I to know what actually, for this general purpose thing, I don't know all the different applications that digital technology could have in Latin America and the Caribbean, all the different, you know, the diversity of, of the entire region and the Caribbean and Brazil. And these are so different, these countries. So who am I to know? So we basically reached out and we reached out and we created, it's called a Delphi exercise, a participatory online exercise that goes in several rounds. First, you ask people like, what do you think matters? Then you show them the, re the result of what they have contributed. And we got hundreds of contributions. So each contribution is, for example, one contribution is from a government. The other one is from a huge telecommunication company. The other one might be, you know, from a, from a local or regional association or from a chamber of commerce, or even also from individuals. Maybe there might be a professor or two who are interested in contributing or NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Then they tell us what matters. And then you show them the result. You go iter iteratively. You show them, well, that's what other people say. And you do both quantitative and qualitative updating. So you do some surveys, you show them, well, that's how the opinion distribution falls. And it actually interesting, it crystallizes very quickly. So the topics that are very polarizing, they just like fall out. And the other one, some other people come to the middle. And you actually very quickly with different iterations of showing it evolves towards a pretty coherent agenda. And then you do also some qualitative rounds with personal meetings or interviews. You go and really ask the most important players in that. And then well, in the governmental realm, you do some intergovernmental meetings and that's how the new action plan eventually was created. So that was very broad input, trying to throw a wide blanket in order to capture the different applications of a general purpose technology, be it from a governmental perspective, private sector perspective, associations, non-governmental associations, and so forth. Individuals as well, intellectuals, or anybody who wanted to contribute and trying to see, well, what are possible applications of this general purpose technology? A broad outreach. Now, the antidote to the unpredictable of the side effects is not a broad outreach, it's a deep outreach because the unpredictability of side effects actually needs some expertise. But let's first see what that is. And, and I always come back to this technological revolution when we introduced the cars on the street. And that was actually quite interesting. I once read the transcript of the United States Congress. There have been really long and deep discussions about this policy of introducing, accepting, and allowing you know, cars on the street. And the discussion was actually quite interesting. One of the biggest arguments was that it would never work because the cars will disturb the horses. So how could that actually work and, and, and go together? People, people couldn't understand. The, the second, another big discussion was that it will have far-reaching macroeconomic impacts leading to horrendous unemployment because, for example, all the people employed in the horse whip industry 
will get out of employment. What do we do with them? So we could not possibly introduce the car because of these severe effects on the, on the employment. And the ones who argued in favor of the introduction of the car were actually the interesting argument here was that it will clean up the cities. Because imagine the cities back then, they've been full of horse droppings. That's has been a big hygiene problem and there were the diseases and so forth you just had the streets were full of this so the argument was well if you reduce the number of horses you reduce the number of horse droppings the hygiene will improve and the cities will become cleaner little did we know that a hundred years later we couldn't breathe the air anymore so did did the car really make the cities cleaner yes we don't really remember the horse droppings anymore we're just like out in the smog and, and worry about that. So this is extremely interesting to see how far off we were. And if you probably right now see the discussions that are going on in Congress or with regard to regulation, I don't even want to know what people in a hundred years will review these documents and how they will scratch their head and be like, whoa, really? That's, that's what they were thinking that uh, artificial intelligence and, and global digital networks lead to? Like, that's what they're concerned about. But hey, you're trying to do our best and we don't have many options because it's coming. It's coming for sure. And here we are discussing driverless cars will be I don't know, scaring the horses or what will they do? And it's it's very difficult to make predictions here. So the best we have to do, we can do, the best we can do and, and actually must do is to reach out to get specialized input. Because while in general, it's quite naive and, and we are all quite naive and even the biggest expert one, but maybe experts who spend their day thinking about some quite particular things will know a little bit more than maybe you and me. And that would be the hope to reaching out to them and trying to get them together. So you also sometimes get these experts groups and these focus groups together and try them. Okay, so what could happen is do some simulation games of what might happen there. And that has been in the history of forecasting, has been successful, has always been wrong and will always be wrong, will never be perfect, but has been quite successful. And that's also what we did in this exercise here. We reached out and you can see uh, we were able to attract quite an educated crowd, a, a lot from the private sector, which is great because they're at the forefront of innovation. But again, mix it up, make it broad with civil society, academia, and public sector experts as well. And then ask the tough questions. And this is often better done in personal interviews, in scenario planning, in order to get to the depth and go through scenarios of you know, what, what could possibly go wrong.